What can one party to a contract do when they learn that the other is planning to breach the contract? The next case, Hotster versus De La Tour, deals with exactly such a situation. Edgar De La Tour planned a three-month grand tour of the European continent for the summer of 1852. He decided to hire a courier to accompany him on his travels, and so in April he hired Albert Hotster to serve as his courier on the trip, which was to begin on June 1st. But De La Tour soon changed his mind. On May 11th, he wrote that he no longer required Hotchter's services and that Hotchter would receive no compensation. On May 22nd, Hotchter sued De La Tour for breach of contract. And then sometime between then and June 1st, he managed to find another job on just as good terms, but not beginning until July 4th. This case comes from England, and we are reading the decision from the Court of Queen's Bench on appeal after Hotchter won at trial. There were two legal questions for the appeals court to answer. The first was whether Hotchter was obligated, even after receiving De La Tour's letter, to be ready to accompany him on a three-month tour of Europe beginning on June 1st. Note that this would have prevented him from accepting the alternative employment beginning on July 4th. The second question was whether Hotchter could sue De La Tour before June 1st, given that De La Tour had not yet failed to meet any of his contractual obligations. On both of these questions, Chief Justice Lord Campbell ruled for Hotchter. The court answered these questions together with two main arguments a doctrinal argument, and an economic argument. Lord Campbell finds no universal rule that whereby agreement and act is to be done on a future day. No action can be brought for a breach of the agreement till the day for doing the act has arrived. He runs through a number of examples where courts have allowed such suits. In contracts of marriage where one party marries someone else, in contracts to lease a particular property where the lessor leases it to someone else for the same time period, and in contracts for purchase of goods where the seller sells them to someone else. In this case, he suggests that if De La Tour had set sail for Australia before June 1st arrived, Hotchter could have sued for breach under the same precedence. The court finds that when parties enter into these sorts of contracts, quote, there is a relation constituted between the parties in the meantime by the contract and that they impliedly promise that in the meantime neither will do anything to the prejudice of the other inconsistent with that relation. When someone marries someone other than his or her fiancé, or as in this case, a party renounces a commitment, that person has breached, quote, an implied contract if either of them renounces the en engagement, unquote. What this means is that De La Tour has already breached the contract when he sends the letter to decline Hotchter's services. And so Hotchter is freed from his obligation, obligations and free to sue. These two, these two forms of repudiation are still recognized in contract law. Section 250 of the second restatement describes two methods by which a party can repudiate a contract. The first is subsection A. It, it, it's an explicit repudiation of the sort De La Tour gave to Hotchter. Not just any statement counts as a repudiation, though. Courts have made clear that there must be a definite and final communication of the intention to forego performance before the anticipated breach may be the subject of legal action. The second type of repudiation is in subsection B, and it includes actions that are inconsistent with the promiser's ability to complete his or her pr promise. The past precedents cited by Lord Campbell fall into this category. A fiancé who marries someone else has rendered herself, quote, apparently unable to perform, unquote. The general rule from this case has also been incorporated into scattered sections of the uh, UCC dealing with repudiation, including repudiation by conduct. Lord Campbell also makes an argument based on considerations of economics and public policy for why Hotster should be free to find a new client. By allowing him to do so, quote, 
Instead of remaining idle and laying out money in preparations which must be useless, he is at liberty to seek services under another employer. Unquote. This arrangement is better for De La Tour as well. Hotchter will be able to mitigate damages by finding other employment earlier. De La Tour will only owe the lost wages from June 1st to June 3rd instead of being on the hook for the entire summer. Hotchter, as the innocent party, will also not be forced to suffer an unavoidable an avoidable upfront loss simply in order to retain the ability to recover damages from De La Tour. Lord Campbell also decides that there's no need to wait for months until the damages are real rather than speculative. The jury can calculate them right now. As public policy, this decision makes good sense. It's better for the economy if people like Hotchter find new work rather than just sitting idle when another party breaches. By freeing such parties from their obligation to perform under repudiated contracts while allowing them to retain their rights to sue for any damages they have suffered, we avoid deadweight economic loss. Okay, so here's a question. A retailer enters into a requirements contract with a manufacturer. The manufacturer discovers that it will not be able to meet the retailer's requirements and informs the retailer of that fact. Can the retailer buy products from a different supplier? Yes. The retailer can seek a new supplier, even though the requirements contract obligated it to purchase all of its requirements from the manufacturer. The manufacturer has now indicated that it's not going to meet its contractual obligation to supply all of the retailer's needs, and so the retailer is also released from its obligation to buy exclusively from the manufacturer. In this case, we have seen that one party's anticipatory breach of contract has two corresponding effects for the other party to the contract. First, that party immediately gets the right to sue for damages related to the breach. And second, that party is immediately released from its own obligations to perform under the contract. In particular, it can seek out substitutes in the market.